We're going to begin. I would like uh, to take the opportunity to, wel to welcome Per Byland, uh, who is a fellow of the Mises Institute and an associate professor of entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship and Records Johnson Professor of Free Enterprise in the School of Entrepreneurship in the Spears School of Business at Oklahoma State University. I would like everyone to please give a warm welcome, make it sound big for Sunday morning, for Per Byland. All right, thank you. Friends, comrades, <laughs> thanks for being here this morning. So I was thinking of what to call this presentation. And being an academic, I found the driest, most boring title, <laughs> Entrepreneurship versus Regulations, just to get you up on, in this morning. I was thinking, however, that maybe I should do something pithier, something cooler. So I was playing with maybe this title instead. Even libertarians don't understand how destructive regulations are. A little more offensive, but no offense. I mean, I sometimes call myself a libertarian too, um, in my status days. Or I could have called it perhaps libertarians underestimate the power of entrepreneurship. And I'm going to cover all three in a sense, talking about first, how we do underestimate and misunderstand regulations and how destructive they actually are, and then move ahead and talk a little bit about what we can do about it, um, if I have time. Well, I'll just leave it with, with that. So first of all, we tend to think of regulations as destructive. Right? How many of you have used that argument that regulations are, are destructive? Okay, that's wrong. And I'm going to tell you why, because that's way too mild. <clears throat> the thing is that if there is destruction, there's a temporary setback. So if there's a bomb going off or a house burns down or something like that, well, then you're going to try to rebuild the house. But the thing is that you're still acting in accordance to whatever you value most. You're still able to maximize from the situation you're in. Right? You were set back, but as Mises and others would teach us, you're still aiming for what you personally value the highest. And that is still possible, of course. Right? So destruction, eh, temporary setback, is going to hurt us. We're going to probably uh, rearrange or, or, or reorder the values that we want to accomplish, that we want to attain through our actions. So of course, if our house burns down, we have nowhere to live, so then we're going to put eh, somewhere to live very high on the list. We're still going to try to attain that value. We're still trying to get what is highest on our list. So in that sense, we're free to do what we want, okay? That's destruction. It sucks. But it's not nearly as bad as regulations. And the thing with regulation is that it's not destruction. It doesn't actually destroy any value that we have. It just outlaws or puts a burden on certain choices. Now, to some people, that sounds milder, because it doesn't destroy anything. The thing is, it lasts. This shit lasts. And it's there all the time. And we do not immediately update our value scales. What I mean by that is that if they outlaw living in a house and you have a house, you still want to live in that house, and the house is still there, so there is a value that is attainable, physically speaking, but you're not allowed. Which means every day when you make choices, every day when you're acting to make your life better off, as we always do, we see that damn house and we can't live in it. So every time we make a choice, we lose out on that whatever it is that is at the very top, perhaps, of our value scales every time. So we have to choose something that is lower. And it's not because we cannot pursue it, it's because someone artificially added a burden to our situation, told us, you may not. Which is okay if you're five years old and your parents say that, right? Because they probably have, have your best at heart anyway. Politicians, let's not go there. 
Okay, so the problem here is that we lose a possible action that is probably at very high on our value scale. We can still pursue it, but we're not allowed. Now that's a huge problem, is it not? Which means we lose every time, every day. We lose that freaking thing, and we can still see it. Until we update our value scales and we think, ah, uh, living in a house, who cares? It doesn't really matter. A tent is fine, right? <laughs> then, when we have updated it, then, then, it's, then we're good again and we can continue. But the problem is that we're not maximizing, right? We're not allowed to maximize. So the, this is obviously a problem. It's a cost that is added to us, a burden that is imposed on us day after day after day, whereas the destruction is not. So you can see how it's, how it's different, right? It's not the same thing. Okay, so we know, and we have learned from Bastiat and Hazlitt and others, that regulations you know, yeah, there's a scene of the unseen. You've heard of the broken window. Okay, so if we take one action, we're going to lose the other action. It's basically opportunity cost. Uh, it's just the, the basis of economics, of understanding the economy, right? So, okay, so regulation that takes that option away from us, it would do something else. It's probably the second best anyway. So we lose whatever is in between, and then we just move it ahead and we go on with our days, and, and that's fine. It's not fine, because life is not a one-shot game, right? It's not the seen and the unseen in the present. The economy and society is cumulative. Now, let's think about that. If it's cumulative, if the market is a process, everything builds off of what was already built. If regulation then takes one option away from us that is very high, because otherwise it's not effective, right? A regulation that does not take our highest valued options away from us is not going to have an effect because we're going to go for what is highest anyway. So a good, effective regulation takes the highest values away from us. Well, that means we do something else. That means whatever comes after builds off of this something else that is lower on our value scale. And we keep on losing what is higher. So the market starts to uh, represent our second best options, assuming there's one regulation, not our best options. And then it goes again and takes that option away from us again. So we get the second best based off of the second best. And then the second best based off of the second best, best based off of the second best. Now we're in trouble, because right? this is a very different trajectory than we would have been on. Right? And we're producing goods and services and jobs and all kinds of things that we would value that are not based off of what we would value most. So this is a very different world suddenly, right? We're losing out like crazy. And that's what I call the unrealized because all those opportunities that would have been there are not. And if you think about it, how long have we had regulations of the marketplace? Is it since Biden? No? Maybe Trump started? No, it goes back to the freaking feudal days. And then we have regulations which are adding hundreds and thousands of regulations. And of course, if they would print this as a book, it would be like this thick or something. And that's the world we're in. So all these opportunities that we have, all these goods and services we can buy, all this welfare, and, well, I should say well-being, our prosperity is based off of these, not second best choices, but probably more like 312 best choice, and then cumulative doing that. That's our glorious world. So what are we missing out on? Well, who knows? It could be my summer cabin on Jupiter. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what this contemporary capitalism is like, because it is a severely distorted state. If you think about the cumulative effect of regulations, and if you think about all of those things that never happened, all of this unrealized, then the world we live in is nothing like the world would have been had we been free. Not even close. 
And we're not talking about just our lifetimes. We're talking about many, many generations going back. Okay? So we have no clue what it would be like. Everything that we get today is completely twisted, in a sense. So this is what we need to think about when we're talking about how regulations affect us. This is the world we're losing out on, the world we know nothing about, because we're basically a few hundred years behind where we would have been otherwise. Okay? Now, in this contemporary capitalism, there's also this, this little issue with consumer sovereignty, right? Because we all know the public choice arguments and the, the captured agencies and things like that, right? When you take all these options away, you, take, you minimize and limit entrepreneurship as well. And you provide corporations with great power because the corporations can capture politicians. I mean, they, they love to be captured, so it's, it's a bad term. But they play with the government. This is not uh, an exception. This is the rule. Because whatever c corporation is currently uh, in business and making a lot of money, they're in business and making a lot of money because they're playing with government. So the consumer basically has no say. The consumer has to pay, at the, in the end, for some businesses. Because many businesses, say Pfizer, for instance, they have product development. Uh, the government picks up the tab. They produce the product. They sell it. The government, hey, why not? And how many doses of their vaccine did, did the Biden uh, regime buy? Was it like 1.2 billion or something? Makes perfect sense for 300 million people. That's their income, right? Pfizer, who's the consumer? The consumer is not part of the picture at all. The consumer doesn't decide. We don't even get to decide because this government steps in and says we have to take their products. And that's what it looks like in a lot of industries. This is pretty nasty because in a free market, the consumer would be king. In this market, the consumer is not even present. Or in a sense, the consumer is consumed. Right? That's our role. We just sit there and get whatever is injected into our bodies or eat whatever is fed to us. We go wherever we're told to. That's what consumers do. So consumer sovereignty, which is core to understanding the market, it's not really at play. You could say that sucks. Right? Just a little bit. So that's where we're at. This is where I figured I'll stop here and just brighten your Sunday. Right? Well, it actually gets worse. <laughs> so let's talk about the regulatory state, because that's just the state acting on the market and limiting the market and how it works. But the state is smart. If the state would regulate everything itself, it would cost them too much. Right? They would need a lot of police officers. They would need a lot of bureaucrats. I mean, don't get me wrong. They have a lot of bureaucrats. But they would need a whole lot more just for the enforcement of all these rules. Well, that's not how they do it. Because in corporate capitalism or state capitalism or just corporativism, whatever you want to call it, they don't have to do it. They just ask. Let's ask uh, businesses to do it for them and say, you cannot be in business unless you enforce it, right? So when you fly, for instance, which I did um, the day before yesterday and will do tonight again, you have to wear a mask. Where is the government agent telling you to wear a mask? Sure, there's the TSA goon, but, but on the plane, they're saying, you will, have, you will face severe uh, fines or be thrown in jail if you don't wear a mask properly. Okay, who's going to throw me in jail? The flight attendant. <laughs> Obviously a very strong one. Of course, they, they will just call the cops or whatever, but they will decide that I need to go to jail. That's not what a corporation should do, right? 
but they do. So we're controlled not by the state, but by the state's businesses, in a sense. I don't know if you saw the CEO of Delta a few days ago. He had a, an op-ed claiming that the government should run the no-fly list. Because each of these uh, airlines, they have a no-fly list for customers that are extra nasty. They cause a lot of, of problems, and some people do. So they, they have their own, and it's like, the government should do this. I was like, holy crap, this guy is insane. Imagine the, these corporations just reporting to a centralized database. So let's say the CIA could take care of it or something, where, they, oh, this is a troublemaker, and then you cannot tra travel at all. How do you take your name off the list? Hmm, not our problem. Great. What a nice world. But that, of course, is a cost savings for him and, and Delta in this case. And it makes sense because they're already working so closely with government. So they can enforce it, but why do we need the cost of, of updating the database and running virus scans and all this stuff? Can, maybe the government can do that instead. Okay, so all these corporations are really arms of the state because they have to. They are enforcing the rules simply because Otherwise, they can't run their businesses. They're not allowed to. So it's not wrong to say that these corporations are basically part of the government, but they're private enforcement agencies. OK, so what they have then is a state that, through regulations, not only controls us, but uses all these corporations to control us, which means it's a little bit arbitrary. right? I mean, different airlines different airplanes, they, they enforce, say, the mask mandate differently. Some flight attendants, they're OK with, if, if you breathe through your nose and not through the mask. Others, they say you have to drink with the mask on. I'm, I'm not sure how that works. but So it, it depend, depends exactly on who it, who's doing it. And they're not held responsible. You cannot um, report them. To whom? Would you call the, the, the Delta or American Airlines call center and say, hey, th there was this flight attendant. She told me to wear a mask in a certain way. Well, you can guess what they would say. They would not say, we will, we will talk to her. No. They would just hang up on me, probably. <laughs> right? So we are in this world where basically we have everything within the state, nothing outside the state, and nothing against the state. And you might recognize those words. How many of you recognize those words? OK, do you recognize this guy? He's dead, I think. But this is pretty damn close. This is where we're at. But we're not here because we have some guy with, with his arm up in the air uh, shouting. We're here because of regulations and that impose these, um, these rules onto corporations. And corporations enforce them on us so we have no say whatsoever in this market where consumer doesn't really have a whole lot to do, a whole lot to say. We can't, we can't change anything at all. Right? This is very different from how a market should work. OK, so how do we fight this beast? Whoop. Well, I could stop here. Right? So see you later. This is nice. Well, I, I think there are several ways that we can do this. But the main one is simply do what we preach. Because what we're living in, the economy we're in, is not a free market. We, we know this, right? But it's not even close to a free market. And the free market is not about a, a new regime. It's not about we need to impose a free market on the economy. No, the free market is just acting. It's do, doing what we want. Right? It's exchanging with people for mutual benefit. So why don't we just do that? Now, entrepreneurship, real entrepreneurship, is not about these corporations. The corporations, they, can, they, they cut costs and they don't care about the consumer because they're in, basically in bed with government. Entrepreneurship is different. Entrepreneurship is about providing consumers with value. It's not about providing government with services. 
So to me, entrepreneurship and corporations, the way they work today, they're very different beasts, completely different. They even aim at pleasing different actors, let's put it that way. Okay, value creation in terms of entrepreneurship happens in the market whether or not there are regulations whether or not you abide by regulations. So you can run a business and you can provide goods and services and people accept. If it is allowed or not, doesn't really matter, you're providing value. Right? If it is not allowed, if it's, if it's uh, regulated, then it, there are extra burdens and there are extra risks, but you're still doing the market thing. Right? What this means is that any entrepreneurial action really undermines government. It undermines all of government's institutions. It undermines government's power because you're providing value to the consumer, as you should be doing, and the corporation does not get that power. So you're, in a sense, you're, you're, you stop feeding the beast, you're feeding the market instead, okay? And we've seen this, how this can have enormous effects in the economy and for us as a society. And sometimes it's called uberification, which I hate that term, but I think, you, I think you know what it means, right? Uber was just a small business offering ride sharing, basically a taxi service without a taxi company. Well, taxi services were highly regulated, and in many towns you had this council that regulated and determined how many taxi cars and how many taxi businesses can there be in this town. Right, the medallion system in New York and so forth. Well, who were on these councils? Well, representatives for the tax companies. So how do you enter this market? Well, you need basically approval from your future competitors. Well, that's not going to happen. So what did Uber do? They said, screw this. We're going to do something completely different. We figure some other way. We figure out how to do this that consumers want in a different way, not just compete in the way economists, mainstream economists, think of competition. That's, ooh, another guy doing exactly the same thing. No, this is a guy doing something completely different, providing consumers with value. <clears throat> and what happened? Lots of taxi businesses went under because consumers, they don't really value the service, right? Because you don't know really when the taxi is going to show up. It's usually a pretty ugly, old, beaten car a rude driver, all this stuff, right? And you overpay. And then you could choose the opposite instead, which is the entrepreneurial thing, right? The app, you know exactly who is coming, when they're coming, it's a nice car, you pay less. Terrible. Well, it changed everything, right? It changed regulations too. So in many towns, Uber, they were not allowed. And I, I was living in Columbia, Missouri at the time when Uber started launching their service in Columbia. Well, they were immediately, the, the council said, you cannot. So Uber said, okay, we won't charge. Well, if you're not charging, it's not really a product that you're offering anymore, right? So it's just a gift. And they weren't allowed to re regulate gifts. So they tried to regulate them anyway, and the police had raids and all this stuff. So the police were basically using the Uber app, ordering Ubers. Whenever someone showed up, they went, oh, jail. Right? But people used those services anyway, and they figured out ways to, to identify the cops and things like that. And now, of course, there are Ubers all over the place. And taxi companies, not all over the place. Okay? This changed completely the market by simply circumventing the regulations. And anyone can do this. Okay, so since the whole market is regulated, any revolution counts, but some industries are more regulated than others. And if they're regulated, they're basically protected from entrepreneurship. They're protected from someone revolutionizing how things are done. And some industries are, are more protected than others. Those industries are ripe for disruption. And there are a couple that that I think are, are going to go down the, uh, the drain, basically. It's higher ed. You can, you can tell because we're doing exactly the same thing that people did in the 1400s. With this level of innovation, nothing for 700 years, 
obviously we're protected. <laughs> healthcare is the same thing. <clears throat> now you might think, what are you talking about? There's plenty of innovation in healthcare. No, only treatments, not in how it's actually done. You still have large hospitals, you still have the hierarchy and all this stuff. That organization is ripe for disruption. But this will need to go through uberification because they're so protected um, by regulations. So someone will need to figure out how to do this in a different way. And then everything will just fall. People have tried in higher ed, but they're trying by doing exactly the same thing, just putting it online or something. That's not really what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is providing a different type of service. And we're going to get there. Revolutions also happen locally. Right? And that's where we're seeing a lot of, of these changes that have to take place because someone local is just offering value to someone and they're paying in return. No big deal, right? Except super illegal, probably. Well, if it's, even if it's super illegal, you both benefit from doing it, so why wouldn't you? And you are educating the other party that, hey, there's nothing wrong here, right? The regulation must be wrong because we're both benefiting. So you're educating the public at the very same time. And if you're local, you're under the radar, and you're not making a, a, a big stink out of it, not yet. So you are changing the world step by step. OK? OK, so that's a nice theory, right? <laughs> and that's what you would expect from a professor. So I've given you the, the concepts and, and the theory about how, what is going on. And, and what the market would be like, but how do we actually do this? So how do we revolutionize the market? So this is where I'm going to stop. No, I'm kidding. So let's think about what we can do. And if we start thinking like entrepreneurs, I think we can change the world easily. And we can start at the very bottom, just trading amongst ourselves, just offering services. Heck, if you, if you ask the neighbor's son to mow your lawn and you pay him, that's probably illegal. That's a, a black market action, which is just no, it's nonsense, right? But that's, that's where it is. Entrepreneurship is about figuring out stuff that the, even the consumer hasn't figured out. So many fake economists, they tend to think of demand as driving the whole economy. It's not, that's bullshit. Very often, new products that revolutionize the world, they're something that consumers have never thought of before. So when the consumers see it, they go, wait a minute, whoa, this is pretty cool. That's how you make a sale. That's how you revolutionize something. That's how you, how you change the world. So you need to figure out, how can you serve the consumer? How can you serve someone else? And then they will be willing to pay for it, of course, if, if the value is high enough. You have to provide value on their terms. So if you offer them something that makes their life better in, in whatever way, on their terms, they're willing to pay for it. They're willing to pay a price that is lower than the value, of course, because they want to benefit from it. Your job is just to be able to offer this at a cost that is lower than the price you can charge. Easy. Well, in theory, not in practice, right? OK. so. Every time I think we do this, every time we offer a service and we go through with an exchange where we're actually placing the consumer, your customer, someone else, it, behind the steering wheel, where you're, where you're satisfying someone on their terms, rather than going through the big corporatist system, you're actually putting a nail in the coffin of the state. And you do that by both educating them of how things could be like, and offering them more value. You're making their lives better. People usually do not complain about that. Right? So I think we can do this small scale and then build up. And the more people are involved in doing this, the better off we are, and the better off everybody we exchange with would be as well. OK, so I'll leave you with, with uh, a few sources of more information if you would like to pursue entrepreneurship, um, or if you take the, the chicken route, like myself, and just want to learn about it and not do it, this is, 
this is uh, where to go. So the Mises Institute has the, the Economics for Business project with, with lots of tools and, and, and guides and so forth for entrepreneurs. Um, there's also a podcast that you can find here. You can just search for Economics for Business on a search engine that works. Um, you can read my columns in Entrepreneur Magazine. There are 50 plus of them. Uh, you can find them there. Find, find uh, they usually <coughs> Austrian libertarian lessons, but in other terms, with usually with a, a list of things to think about and things to do. So, even though everything looks really, really bad, like I said before, I think things are looking really, really good because we can do a whole lot individually and together. Thank you. Would anyone like to come up and ask questions? The answer is yes. Please give your name, ask a short question, and then, well, that's how it works. Keep going. Uh, hi, my name is Rich. Um, one thing I keep hearing about is that entrepreneurship's a mindset. It isn't necessarily just like, oh, I'm going to open a lemonade stand and great, but like that disruptive part and, and you know, that, that really innovative. So do you have a, in theory, a lesson on like how to, how to develop that, how to become a disruptor, how to make a truly valuable business, service, whatever? Yeah, okay. Uh, that's a good question. I think they should avoid thinking about it as a means for disruption. Because right, if you think about, oh, I'm going to disrupt this industry, then you're aiming for the wrong thing. You're aiming for the destruction, really, of those actors that are already in that industry. What you should do is just focus on, how do I serve the consumer? How do I serve other people in the best way possible on their terms? Because that way, you're not, you're not limited to what others are already doing. You limit yourself to where the value is which they're obviously not doing because they require regulations to stay in business. All right, so just focus on whoever it is that you can serve and provide with value and go for that. Then you will, as a, as a, as a result, you will disrupt some industry somewhere. Might not be the one that you think. So I think focus on the consumer is, is the thing to do. Hi, my name is Pam Ian. Uh, what do you say to like I have a lot of statist friends who say that regulations are good and they'll point out um, you know, companies that pollute streams or um, baby car seats and stuff like that. They pollute baby car seats? No, no, no. You have to have it or you can't <laughs> no, <sorry>. drive anywhere. <laughs> yeah, well, what I say is, well, that's a longer discussion. But what I say is part of it is these regulations mean that you cannot find better solutions. You're not allowed. Right? You have to stick to the solutions that already exist. So all this imagination, all this brain power that exists in the world, we're not using it anymore because we're just stopping it in our, in, in our tracks where we're at right now. <clears throat> so that's a, a huge problem. So how many babies are dying with those seats that didn't have to? I mean, that's where we would be going, right? Saving those lives. And then I would say also that it's a, it's a matter of property rights. Your property, your business. Uh, I don't know if you... I recommend listening to an interview recently by Lex Friedman, who has a really good podcast. He talked to uh, Spit Zuckerberg. Uh, and it was very interesting because... I realize that Facebook is actually an AI company. And, and what really I find really scary is we're not even going to be regulated by humans. We're going to be reg regulated by machines. I mean, where do we go from that, and what, what can we really do about that? The small question. Uh, <clears throat> um, I'm not very afraid of AI at all. Uh, and... and the reason is really my view of economics, because the economy is about satisfying people on people's terms. I'm not sure AI can do that at all. AI can disrupt and cause problems, sure, but we can always use entrepreneurship to circumvent these, these uh, regulations. So, I mean, pe people think of AI as, in terms of jobs, everybody's gonna be unemployed because AI is gonna take over. 
No, AI can probably, and robots and so forth, they can probably make already existing production processes more efficient. They cannot develop new production processes that fit with what people will actually want. That requires human imaginability. Imaginability, is that a word? Okay. Uh, ingenuity, that's better, thank you. Uh, that requires us. Right? We have to produce an AI that is us, or even beats us at being us. I don't think that is even possible, and we're definitely not close. We're, we're, we can use algorithms, and we, we know how accurate and good they are. Hi, uh, I'm John. Um, my question is, you mentioned uh, much of the entrepreneurial successes have been bypassing or skirting regulations, getting around them somehow. And so once that, uh, once that invention or service has become successful and is in the marketplace, in your experience, how often does that regulation that it's going around and is probably still causing inefficiencies, how often is that uh, de-legislated uh, or gotten rid of? Because there is that, as you mentioned, the cumulative effect of these regulations so that it keeps making things inefficient even though it's still better than the state solution. I think politicians are usually not in the business of rolling back regulations. <clears throat> Let's put it that way. Um, I think the regulations become ineffective and they're simply not enforced anymore. So I think I, I read somewhere, don't quote me on this, but it's, it's a good example. I think in Denmark, if you are driving a motor vehicle, you're supposed to have someone walking in front of it with a red flag warning the horses. That's not enforced. Right? If it was, then Denmark would definitely not be a d developed nation. Right? <clears throat> it's still there, I understand, but it's just not enforced. And I think that's, that's, sort of the, that's where all regulations will go because they're either just crazy or they don't apply to anything. I'm sure there are plenty of regulations of horses and buggies, for instance, that are still in effect, I mean, legally speaking, but nobody really cares because we're driving automobiles. And I think that is where regulations are headed. We're going to have a, a, a big mausoleum or a museum, perhaps, of regulations that simply aren't used, which is also an indication of, of I think, what the future will look like, because the more regulations we have that never apply, the more obvious it becomes for people that regulations, they suck. Right? The world is changing, regulations do not. Hey, I'm Rob. Um, so one of the biggest things is, I would kind of push back on the um, not being afraid of AI, uh, because it doesn't really matter how principled any of us in this room are. One of the biggest things is um, the presence of the IRS in the form of like taxes. Um, and I know that this isn't just to rail against them, but it's a very difficult thing to uh, try to be an entrepreneur. I, I am not, but um, being perpetually caught up in permitting things, and it's very easy to say and even do on a very small scale yes, I give you value, you know, you pay me for said value or service. Um, but at the, end of the, at the end of the day, if that's ever going to scale, uh, my understanding is that Uber has, you know, took enormous losses in the form of like fines and penalties and things like that. Are there co-ops or anything that you're aware of or movements to try to, um, it's very difficult for like one entrepreneur to really poke up because as soon as you poke up, you, you know, you get the heavy hand of whatever regulatory agency and ultimately the IRS in the form of liens and, and things like this, especially in a fiat world where almost all of your physical resources are going to be you know, leveraged unless you're independently wealthy from something else. Mm -hmm. um, so what's kind of your take on how to fight that? Because that's really like the rubber meets the road because they're going to take it or they're going to take your stuff. And that is difficult to overcome. Yeah, one solution is not to grow. Okay. And I'm, 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 I'm serious. So like agorism sort of? Like, yeah. Okay. Sure. I mean, that's basically what I'm talking about, agorism or agorism or depending on your camp, I guess. Um, when I talk to entrepreneurs who start businesses, many of them, or have started businesses and are successful, many of them, you ask the question, would you do this again if you had the chance? 
And they're like, no way in hell, because I had no clue what I was doing. And they don't mean that they had no clue in figuring out the value of what they were doing. They had no clue that there were so many regulations and license requirements and all this stuff and all the reporting. Had they known and complied, they would never have been able to start a business. Right? And that, I think, applies to a lot of businesses. They're just ignorant, and they're very happy with being ignorant. And then when they grow, then they will be noticed. But most entrepreneurs, they don't know, and they don't care, and they don't have time for it either. Right? So that is a revolutionary force. Hi, I'm Kurt. Uh, Approximately two years ago, there was a sudden flurry of regulation, you might say, as restaurants were closed down and bars were shuttered. And, uh, the FS people around here uh, ran one of those agorist things. We had parties. We, um, place, place was not known. You know, we didn't like put it in the newspaper or something. But there were, I'm reminded of uh, someone who showed up with a whole bunch of food, cooked wonderfully. And we had 50 to 100 people dinners at a time when it, we weren't supposed to have more than five people in any given place. And uh, although it, I don't know how much money exchanged hands in terms of uh, remuneration, there was a whole lot of value created. And the next time, if anything like that happens, it's going to be even easier because we tried it once already and it worked. Yeah, not a you. <laughs> no, I agree. I mean, do more of that. Anything underground is good. That, that has been happening. Um, I remember I went to the monthly meetings of some of our people without masks right at the beginning of COVID when they were with the mask minute. We didn't care. We just did, went and did it. Yeah, good. That's good. I mean, I did the same on, on campus. I mean, it's, you know, it's not very revolutionary, but... I never enforced mask mandates in my classroom. I never wore a mask in the classroom. Why would I? Can you hear me? Yeah. Could you go up the mic? It's good exercise on the Sunday morning. Yeah, it's good for your steps app. <laughs> Um, my name's John, and um, how prevalent is the black market, and is there a percentage of it that's necessary in a healthy economy? Well, a healthy economy would not have a black market because everything would be allowed. Um, <clears throat> I think the black market is probably much bigger than we realize, and it's because the black market is not only uh, drug cartels and things like that. It's, like I mentioned, hiring your neighbor's son to mow the lawn, that's black market. So any exchange that is not recorded with the IRS, that's black market. So the black market is a big chunk of the economy. And I think we would benefit and freedom would benefit if we would actually tell people that eh, this is what free market is like. You know what we just did. You got stuff you wanted, I got stuff I wanted, and we're both happy. That's, that is the market. The other stuff you're seeing, <clears throat> that's not, that's something else. I mean, if we just remind people of this, then they will, they will start looking for more signs, and maybe they will be more aware of what they're doing. And that will undermine the state's power, I think. Would you recommend if, if I know it's sometimes uh, advantageous to actually be involved in the legal uh, way of doing things, to have financial statements. Do you think it might be a good idea to start off in the illegal section first as a way to build up? Sure. Why not? <laughs> I mean, as long as you're creating value, I'm, I'm, I'm on board. And, and do it in... But that's, the, that's the issue for, for the entrepreneur, right? Just figuring out how to produce value for others on their terms, and then keeping your costs under way under, hopefully, the price that you can charge. The law of secondary matter. Uh, good morning. My name is Doug. I'm, a, I'm in healthcare. 
uh, obviously a very heavily regulated uh, space. And I'm a big fan of Mary Ruart's book, Death by Regulation, and the, the core thesis is she thinks the FDA should be stripped of all regulatory power and become a purely advisory agency. Um, <clears throat> But as a sort of a gradualist Fabian approach, you're probably aware of the right to try laws. If you could start like kind of leveraging that, say, listen, you, you can, a, a patient can sign. I realize I'm outside the bounds. I recognize, I accept the responsibility and just kind of erode away gradually. Because a lot of people really want that, 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 the safety of having big brother at least weighing in on a topic. And if the FDA says something, you're crazy to put this in your body, a lot of people will listen. Even I would be inclined to listen. But that's not a question, or if you want to weigh in on that topic. But I think it's a great book. Yeah, and, and Mary Ruiz is, is great, too. Um, no, I, I, I agree. Is this where I'm supposed to say that I'm not a medical doctor, so this is not medical <laughs> advice? Probably a good idea. Okay, yeah, okay, I, I just said it, for the record. No, I think... Anything Mary has written, you should read. Okay, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>